All right, hi everyone. Thank you for having me here. As as was stated, my name is Brian, and fancy title is I. I'm here to talk to you today about energy storage. More specifically, to talk to you about the role of energy storage in creating zero emission energy systems, but also to be able to characterize what are the benefits that we get from deploying energy storage and compare those against the impacts that we incur from the life cycle associated with these kinds of technologies. So this is an outline of my presentation today. Um, the, I was asked to spend the first part of my presentation to talk a little bit about my career path, so I'll start with that. But then I'll talk about some motivation, the energy system and policy context for why we need energy storage and why it's such a popular topic right now. Then I'll get into an issue of scale, basically trying to look at how much energy storage do we need to meet a lot of California's policy goals regarding decarbonization or renewable utilization. Then the sort of the crux of my presentation is this last section where I talk about net benefits. Once we have a sense for how much energy storage we need, we need to talk about whether deploying that much energy storage is a good idea from an environmental standpoint. And then with, I'll mainly be using an example from vanadium redox flow batteries, because that's what we've been at assessing. And then we'll conclude with some summary points. So before I get into storage, let's talk about my career path and where I came from. So when I entered college um, as an undergrad in 2005, so a while ago, um, I originally wanted to work on aircraft and spacecraft propulsion, um, because Planes in space are cool, and that's since I was young, I was like, you know, flight is cool, and going into space is cool, and it's just, I think a lot of people have had that sort of feeling at one point or another. So I actually entered as aerospace only, and I kind of picked up a knack for thermodynamics. I liked thermodynamics, that was my favorite subject in the mechanical and aerospace engineering curriculum. And I took my second level of thermodynamics class with Professor Scott Samuelson, who's the head of the Advanced Power and Energy Program that I'm now a part of. And not verbatim, but he essentially told me something along the lines of making advancements in propulsion for aircraft and spacecraft, like that's cool, right? And that's like exciting. But on the other hand, if we don't make advancements in energy technology and energy systems, we can enable a lot of bad things to happen, right? So what he said was a lot more than that, but that's kind of the summary of it. And so I kind of thought about that a bit. And kind of from that point, I decided to go into energy because that's where I feel like that I can make a larger impact, right? Or have a larger impact in the world and have a positive influence on the way things are going. So since then, I've been in the energy field. So the next thing I want to talk about is my research trajectory. And I'm going to start from when I was an undergraduate all the way through to today. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because it sort of reflects how my perspective on addressing issues in the energy space and the energy system sort of has progressed. So when I was an undergrad, um, I, I mean, fancy words aside, I basically worked on trying to improve the design of a single type of technology. It's called a solid oxide fuel cell gas turbine hybrid system. Basically, it's a very high efficiency, low criteria pollutant emission type of power plant that you can use for following the electric load on the grid, right? And this was, you know, in the mid 2000s. But the main thing I want you to take away from this is that I started in the energy field, as I think a lot of people do, with a focus on a single technology, right? How do you take one, tech, one type of energy technology and make it the best that it can be, right? And you see people do that with solar panels. How do you make these solar panels more efficient and things like that, right? Then going into graduate school, um, I went into graduate school around 2009. And this was just after the first renewable portfolio standards and decarbonization goals were set in California, right? So there was a lot of talk at the time to look at, hey, if we have a 20% or 33% RPS, which was what it was at the time, how is the grid gonna be able to handle that? Like our grid has never had to deal with that before. What are sort of the challenges that we're going to run into? So that's what I did my master's in, which was basically looking at identifying what are the obstacles on the grid for integrating a lot of renewables and trying to evaluate the effectiveness of some different solutions for overcoming those obstacles, right? And I also interned at the California Air Resources Board and wrote a report, internal report, exactly on that topic. But the main theme from my master's research is I went from a single technology focus to looking at a suite of technologies integrated into one type of infrastructure. In this case, that's the electricity infrastructure. Now, going into my PhD, I kind of started to think a bit broader because I was like, okay, electric, the electricity system doesn't operate in a vacuum, right? 
the ability of the electricity system to operate and meet loads and then meet all these renewable goals is affected by what goes on in other sectors that depend on electricity, such as transportation through electrification and then also water supply. And then also the, pro the progression of the electricity resource mix in turn affects those other sectors, right? So for my PhD, I was thinking, okay, we don't want to optimize the design of one type of infrastructure in a way that interferes with other sectors' ability to meet their own goals, right? So my PhD was focused on basically looking at what are the interactions between electricity, transportation, and water, and taking those interactions into account, how do we roll out the technology mix in each of these sectors in ways that allow each of them to meet their goals, such as water security or certain amount of renewable penetration and so on. And basically, how do you do that in a way that doesn't interfere or kind of compromise on an individual sector's ability to meet its goal? And the theme of that is I went from looking at a single infrastructure to looking at how different infrastructures are coupled, right? Now, after school, I was a staff scientist in UCIFF for two years. And this kind of continued on previous themes, but sort of my focus in this stage of my career was on robustness, right? So there is a lot of planning and optimization sorts of exercises you can do to figure out how should the infrastructure evolve, right? But at the same time, our infrastructure's ability to operate gets affected by other things, namely climate change or you know, emerging technologies that are unmanaged, or things like that. So in this stage of my career, I really wanted to look at robustness, where it's like, okay, not only are we trying to plan out how these infrastructures should evolve, how do we make sure that they're able to meet these goals in a robust way, right? So say if all the worst effects of climate change still happen, is our infrastructure still going to be able to operate, right? And that's kind of what I focused on in this stage. And then the stage I'm at right now is as a professional researcher at UC Irvine in civil and environmental engineering. Um, how many of you are familiar with what a professional researcher is? Okay, a couple of people. Okay, so um, largely it's, it's kind of the UC's equivalent title for like a research faculty, non-tenure track. Um, so I gained PI status, which is cool, and I get to mentor a bunch of people. But largely in this stage of my career, it's in addition to continuing on previous themes, I focus a lot on being able to incorporate materials and life cycle analysis and trying to incorporate those with the operational modeling of infrastructures in order to better inform whether certain pathways for deploying technologies is a good idea or not. And that's actually how I came up here. That's how I ended up collaborating with Professor Kendall. And that's where I am today. So just kind of showing how I've sort of just added all these elements as I've gone along, right? So other things, um, I teach at UC Irvine. I'm not required to teach, but I teach one class voluntarily. And it's called Sustainable Energy Systems. And the reason why I teach that class is because it brings a systems level perspective to complement a lot of the technology specific perspectives that students get in their classes. So, you know, if you go through a traditional engineering curriculum, is everyone here an engineering major of some sort or, okay, <laughs> or not? Okay, so anyway, in kind of the engineering curriculum, you know, you, you focus on understanding lots of different physical phenomena and so on. And then when you talk about clean energy in an engineering curriculum, it's usually at the technology level. It's like, oh, this is how a gas turbine works and how do you make it more efficient and things like that. And kind of what I saw was lacking in the curriculum at the time at UC Irvine is no one really talks about how these technologies get put together to make a working energy infrastructure. So that's exactly what the class I teach is on. And I really want, I really try to focus on this is how the energy infrastructure works with all these different technologies. And once we start installing lots of different kinds of technologies that behave very differently than what we're used to, this is how it's going to change the way the energy infrastructure operates or what it's going to require in order to be able to accommodate Right. So that's what I do when I teach. And then um, I also got my PE because why not? So <laughs> I actually don't use it that much in academia, but it does give you a little bit of credibility um, when you talk with industry folk. So I kind of wanted to end my little section on my career path to just kind of talk about a little bit of takeaways. You can take it or leave it based off of what I've learned um, in my career path. And the first thing is that societal challenges are broad and interdisciplinary in scope. And I think um, this group here, the energy graduate group, is a good manifestation of that, right? You get exposed to a lot of different perspectives and you kind of get to see how you can't solve the energy problem by just being really good at one field, right? Or coming up with something that one field really likes. 
So being open to learning the skills and perspectives of people in different fields um, really gives you a better perspective, right? And really kind of helps you avoid advocating for solutions that will have a lot of unintended consequences or things like that. And you'll benefit a lot by being in an environment that exposes you to a lot of those different perspectives. So that seems to be what this group is doing. So I'm glad to see that this is, this is here. The second point I wanna make is whenever you read a journal paper or a study or a report of any kind, pay attention to what it says, but also pay attention to what a study doesn't say. Um, among, in public communication, but even among people that are in the field, one sort of fatal flaw I see is that a lot of people will read a study and sort of take its conclusions as like the answer that's generalizable to like all conditions everywhere. And then they get into big arguments about like whether that suits what their view is or not, right? Remember that most studies, even the studies I'll present here, any of the studies that come out of you know, any university, have con they get you results under certain conditions. Whether those conditions are reasonable or not is sort of something you have to think about. But always pay attention to what a study doesn't say, right? To sort of put bounds upon how you can apply the results from different studies. Third thing I want to talk about is seek to work in environments and with coworkers and advisors that are interested in helping you grow professionally. Um, there are a lot of people that I've known who, you know, stick it out in an environment that isn't really helping them grow professionally, that isn't really growing their talents, and kind of doesn't really value them, right? And, you know, life is short. You don't want to waste your time in your career with people that are not interested in helping you out and don't see you as a value, you know, don't see you as valuable. And finally, find the type of work and working environment that best fits your personality. Going back to the first point, solving societal challenges involves a lot of different kinds of expertise. And what that means is that there is room for a lot of different occupations that you can participate in that can help solve this larger problem. Right? If you're someone that's more outgoing and you like talking to people, maybe you go into science communication. If you're someone who's really hands-on and you like doing experiments, maybe you can go into a field that does a lot of that and sort of contributes to this larger whole. So um, that's off of my soapbox for my career. Now let's get into, now let's get into energy storage. So why energy storage? To a lot of you will be preaching to the choir, but it's always good to go over it. Um, environmental sustainability meaning that there's been a lot of attention that's being given to the fact that the way our energy system operates has a lot of detrimental environmental impacts, right? And we're trying to figure out how do we reduce or get rid of a lot of these impacts. And the big one nowadays is climate change. That's has, what has a lot of the focus. But there's also air, water, and land pollution from various processes associated with different technologies. And, you know, th these are things that we've been talking about for a long time, right? And in a lot of ways, we still haven't solved. But in addition to the environmental side of it, there's also resource security. And basically, a lot of historical events have highlighted the way that our current energy infrastructure is configured is vulnerable to disruptions from all kinds of things, right? If you have um, natural disasters, or right now where PG&E has shut off power to a bunch of people because they're worried about causing wildfires, um, or if you have geopolitical instability, if you're importing a lot of oil from somewhere and then they decide to not like you, then you have a problem, right? So both of these things combined really motivate change in our energy system. And addressing a lot of these concerns hinges on reducing our energy system's dependence on fossil fuels, right? So for climate change, that's increasing the adoption of low and zero carbon primary energy resources, for reducing air pollution and potentially water and land pollution, reducing the reliance on combustion for providing lots of energy services, and improving the resilience of energy services by enabling the penetration of distributed generation. So those are things like rooftop solar photovoltaic or fuel cells you can put in the building, things that are very close by that can produce electricity, um, and also increase the reliance on local and domestic primary energy resources. So when you're thinking about the kinds of different electricity technologies that can sort of fall into that, <coughs> fall into that category, um, on the, from an electricity standpoint, we can sort of separate it into two classes, right? First, we have what are called firm or dispatchable resources, and these are that are non-fossil fuels, and these are things like nuclear, geothermal, uh, reservoir-based hydropower, um, biomass, and biogas um, of certain types. And these are great in that they allow you to be able to control their power generation output to be able to serve the demand. 
But a lot of these resources have limits on how much technical potential there is available to use, and or they may have limits in terms of technical issues to overcome or social acceptance, right? Now, a lot of engineers don't like that social acceptance can be an issue, but if it prevents you from being able to implement it into a real world system, then it's something you have to think about, right? Then we have variable resources, and these are things basically solar and wind, and then to a lesser extent, run of the river hydropower. These are things that they're not inherently controllable, but the reason why we look at these is that they have very high resource potentials, right? When you ask the question of, is there enough solar or wind, that's not really an issue. It's not an issue of whether there's enough of it. And also some of these things like solar photovoltaics are key enablers of microgrids or distributed energy resource systems that can operate independently from the grid, right? So when I say that these variable resources have very high technical potential, um, this was a paper from 2006 that looked at the global exergy, so usable energy, right? Going into the control volume of the earth. And you can kind of see where it ends up. Most of it comes as solar radiation. A lot of it gets absorbed or reflected or it goes into evaporating things. But this, these numbers are in terawatts, so that's a very large number. And globally, you know, there's 5,000 terawatts of solar energy that just gets reflected back into space. That's an extremely large number, right? Um, and then some of that ends up driving wind, 870 terawatts, which is also a very big number. And so all of this is just to say that solar and wind, we're looking at using them because we're not really worried about running out of them, right? Now they're diffuse and they don't align with the load and other things that we're talking about, but that's sort of why we're looking at using these resources. So as I talked about, the issue with solar and wind is that they don't align with the load. And on the electric grid, load and generation have to be balanced at every point in time. If you have, if your load is higher than your generation, meaning you don't have enough generation, you get blackouts. If you have it the other way around, you'll start breaking equipment that depends on a certain grid frequency being met, right? And this is just to show, here we have the red, the red, which is curtailed solar generation. This is generation that is in excess of what the load is at the time, which is this these two blue colors. And what we do want to do is we can install energy storage to charge and capture that excess renewable generation to discharge it when the load occurs, right? So that we're actually making use of these resources. And that's where storage comes in, right? Storage, that's the main role of storage as far as supporting emissions reductions. But I, in this presentation, I am going to focus on the application of storage for capturing excess renewable generation and shifting it to meet load. But before I get too into that, I just want to throw it out there that storage can be used for a lot of different things, right? In addition to that, storage can be used to eliminate the need for peaking power plants, which are dirty power plants that turn on for a short period of time and then turn off, and they produce a lot of air pollutant emissions in the process. They can be used for providing electricity system reliability services, so compensating for forecast errors in the load demand or as temporary backup generation. They can enable microgrids. So if you have solar photovoltaic on your roof and you have batteries like in your house or your buildings, you could theoretically allow that region to operate independently of the larger grid, which is which when PG&E shuts off your electricity because of what's happening right now, you'd still be able to have electricity services. And it can also defer transmission and distribution upgrade requirements, right? By giving more options for managing power flow locally instead of having to import all of that through larger transmission lines. But I, in this presentation, I am going to focus on the first application because that has the most relevance for emissions reductions. So California has a lot of policies and goals that are concrete in terms of being able to meet, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase renewable utilization. First is Senate Bill 100, which means by 2045, we want to have 60% of our electric demand met by renewables and 100% of the electric demand met by zero carbon resources. Um, there is a goal which is an executive order non-binding that was signed by Governor Brown before he left to try and get economy-wide carbon neutrality, carbon neutrality by 2045. And then with regards to energy storage, there's currently a law in the books um, called Assembly Bill 2514 that basically mandates California investor-owned utilities to procure 1.325 gigawatts of energy storage capacity by 2020. I'm very annoyed that this is in power units, but that's how the law is written. So, because there's power units and energy units, but um, that's what's on the books. So, 
with all that context in mind, now that we have these goals we have to meet, how much do we need? <coughs> so does anyone have a guess of how much energy storage we might need to meet all these goals? So you're waiting for me to tell you. Okay, so how much do we need? And the answer is it depends, right? So that's probably not surprising because remember that energy storage by itself doesn't provide any environmental benefit. If you get a battery and you just have it sit there, it, like it doesn't do anything for you, right? Energy storage acts to enable increased use of other resources such as wind and solar. And then by using those resources more, you get environmental benefit, right? And the main thing that energy storage does is it shifts when renewable generation occurs and shifts it from when it originally occurs to when the load occurs, right? That's fundamentally what it does. So if you have other things in your system that do that, or if the misalignment between load and generation is small, then you don't need as much energy storage. So this is kind of what I mean. If your electricity mix doesn't have a lot of variable generation, or if you live in a region where the wind and solar profiles and your load profiles are such that the misalignment between them is relatively short, or you know it has to go over a few hours, so on and so forth, then you don't need as much energy storage. But typically, if you have more variable generation, you'll need more energy storage. But another thing to think about too, it, it also depends on how flexible your electric demand is. So as I said, energy storage takes renewable generation, makes it meet load. You can also take load and shift it to occur when renewable generation is occurring. And then you see that with like the internet of things and like smart appliances and smart EV charging. If you can take loads and align them with generation to begin with, then you don't need as much energy storage to compensate for a misalignment between load and generation. So I'm gonna go through a few studies, some of which were done at APEP and some of which were not done at APEP, that basically try to get at this question of how much energy storage is unique under different configurations. So I'm going to start with an extreme case. And the extreme case, is what if we in California wanted to meet 100% of the electric demand, that means every hour of the year, with wind, solar, and storage only. This is gonna be the case for as much energy storage you could possibly need. And what we have here is we have a graph like this. On the y-axis is the wind and solar energy penetration, and on the x-axis is essentially how much energy storage capacity is installed um, as a percentage of the annual electric load, right, in energy units. And these two different bars are basically how much you overbuild your renewables. So the light blue one has more renewables installed, where both of these, though, are more than you need by 20% or 50% respectively. And what you notice is if you build 20% more renewables than you need, you go from here, which is like 85%. And if you want to get to 100%, you notice you get a big benefit for the first unit of energy storage you install. Then the next unit gives you a smaller benefit and so on and so on and so on and so forth. And then you finally get to 100 about here, which is about 3.7% on this graph, right? And if you build 50% more renewables than you need, then you can hit that earlier. But what does that correspond to in terms of energy storage capacity? This high end corresponds to about 17,000 gigawatt hours of energy storage. Now, that's kind of hard to get a sense of what that is, but each 1% equivalent, so I said 3.7% here of annual load, each 1% on this axis is equivalent to 325 million Tesla Powerwall 2 batteries. That's a very large amount of batteries, right? Or storage in general. And if you compare that to, you know, something like the Tesla Gigafactory, which outputs, is slated to output 50 gigawatt hours of energy storage capacity production per year for use in vehicles, this is like, this is like not good, right? You don't want to have to need this much storage, right? And as I talk about later, there is an environmental impact associated with manufacturing and producing this storage. So you don't want to just go crazy and just throw storage everywhere because um, there's a cost to that. And the reason, yeah. So the question is about the graph. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have a little bit of a hard time understanding what the vertical axis is. It, it, is that like uh, you take some assumed capacity factor and uh, so, multiply yeah. it by installed capacity to yeah, so, meet some given load number? Right? Yeah, so I guess it's not assumed. It's um. What we have is we, we model the electric grid dispatch and we have profiles for wind and solar. And then largely this is the percentage of the load demand that is actually served by wind and solar, right? So the reason why, even though say you have 20% more renewables than you need theoretically, 
in this case, without any research, you only get to 85% because a lot of it ends up getting curtailed, right? So that's kind of, that's sort of what this graph means. So, yeah. And is it current electricity demand? Uh, this is projected to 2050 um, using the E3 pathway study. Yeah. So, okay, cool. And the reason why you get that, those diminishing returns is because this, what we have here is this is a graph of the amount of energy stored in the energy storage system, and this is time over a year. So as I showed about in previous graphs, you know, you have the misalignment between solar generation of a few hours. You have solar occurs during the day, and you need to shift some of that to occur during the night, and that's a few hours, right? Once you solve that misalignment, when solar and the load are also misaligned on much longer timescales, there's differences in seasonal production and seasonal load. And if you really want to go to 100.0% renewable, you need to install energy storage that's capable of shifting energy across those longer timescales, right? And that's kind of what you see here, where it's like, you know, we're charging a lot of time in the summer and spring, or the spring and summer, and then we're discharging a lot of it in the winter, in the fall and winter, getting where there's not as much wind and solar generation. So to address longer term mismatches, the energy storage requirements increase exponentially. That's why on the previous graph, each increment of energy storage doesn't give you as much benefit as the previous one. So that's the extreme case. Let's go to a less extreme case where we're trying to meet you know, 80% renewables by 2050. And in this case, let's bring in that dimension of load flexibility and assume we have a lot of EVs on the grid and the way that they charge on the grid can be of three different methods. There's immediate charging where you just plug your car in and it starts charging until it's full or until you unplug it. There's smart charging where you plug in your vehicle, you tell the grid, my vehicle's gonna be plugged in for X amount of hours, and then it's going to try and optimize the charging profile to coincide with renewables. And then there's vehicle to grid where you can do the same thing, but it also allows the vehicle to discharge energy back to the grid as long as you have a certain amount of charge left over by the time you unplug, right? So now we're gonna look at how much energy storage you need under different scenarios of load flexibility. So what we have here is this y-axis is the power capacity of the energy storage system. And then the x-axis is the energy capacity of the energy storage system, right? So power is, you know, it's how fast you can charge or discharge that energy. Energy is how much, energy capacity is how much you can store, right? And we have this color map here of the renewable penetration, which is the percentage of electric demand that actually ends up being met by renewables. And if you want to hit 80%, you have to be on this line. And largely that occurs because when you do immediate charging, the electric vehicle charging load and the residential load tends to fall outside of when solar is generating. So how many of you drive an electric vehicle? All right. So, so when, you, when you go to work and then you go home, you know, five, six, seven, so on, and you plug in, that, that adds a load to the grid at that time. But at the same time, you also go inside and you try on your TV and you're trying on your, your oven, you start cooking. So you're adding more load on top of an already high load that occurs when people get home, right? And that load is outside of when solar is generating. So you need a lot of energy storage to be able to shift excess renewable generation to meet that load, right? However, if we do smart charging, you get let, you reach that 80% line at a much lower energy storage capacity, right? So I, I didn't have it on the slide, but the previous graph was around a little under 10,000 gigawatt hours. Here, just by changing how you charge your electric vehicles, it cuts that down to this point, which is about, I don't have it on the slide, but it's about 2,300, 2,530 gigawatt hours. So it cuts it down a lot. If the electric vehicle load already aligns with solar generation, then you don't need to use as much energy storage to, to compensate for that misalignment. Then if you do vehicle to grid, where you allow the batteries and electric vehicles themselves, when they're plugged in to act as energy storage, uh, theoretically, you don't need any stationary energy storage at all, right? And that's, now I have a big if here with asterisks because this shows what's possible because if you think about the amount of capacity that's in vehicles by this scenario in 2050 where there's a lot of electric vehicles on the road, it's a very large amount of capacity but there's a lot of practical issues associated with getting people to participate in doing vehicle to grid. There's a lot of practical and technical issues. Um, I can talk to you more about that offline, but this just shows the influence of load flexibility on your requirements for energy storage. 
then um, it's just an aggregated, yeah. Uh, what is smart charging? Is that just like charging at work? Oh no, smart charging is when you allow the electric grid to basically decide when and how much you charge when it's plugged in. So if you have an electric vehicle, you plug it in, you tell the grid, my vehicle's gonna be plugged in for four hours. By the time I unplug, I need 50 additional miles of charge. Then within those constraints, instead of just charging immediately until it's done, the grid is going to look ahead in time and be like, okay, hey, there's about to be a lot of solar generation at this time. We're going to maximize the charging of that vehicle during that time. So that's kind of what smart charging is. Okay. Yeah. And the vehicle to grid is? Vehicle to grid is the same thing, except instead of allow, just allowing the vehicle to charge, the vehicles can discharge energy back to the grid to serve load yeah. within those constraints. And it's all hooked up to whatever you tell it. That yeah. What you need. Yeah, within those constraints. Yeah, There's more questions going on. Yeah, this is a re really interesting result. So I just want to understand this interplay between the vehicle and grid and, and what I understood about your result earlier that mm -hmm. is sort of high storage case is really dominated by your seasonal storage need. Yep. So what you saw was that the, the certain hours, and I didn't pick up if that was winter or summer, but mm -hmm. you know, certain hours where storage is really important, yeah. where it presumably has been charged in the season where you have surplus. So yeah. how does that fit with a vehicle and grid application where you wouldn't yeah. think you're going to have a vehicle waiting around seasonally? Yeah. So does that just mean the flexibility means you don't need the seasonal storage anymore? Um, so uh, that's not what that means, but I want to point out that this is for a different goal. So these, these results is a less extreme case where you're only meeting an 80% reusable goal. So when you're meeting something like 70 to 80%, you don't necessarily have to chase down the seasonal imbalance, right? Because you don't need to get all of it. So yeah, that's what I mean. And then there was a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, so curious, you know, your, your first graph that showed the kind of big benefits for storage, early penetration. Yes. Is that for kind of short duration, kind of frequency regulation? Kind of primary, um, primarily? It's short. So I'd say it's longer than the longer than the time scale of frequency regulation, but it's, it's more like multi-hour shifting. Okay. I would say, yeah. And do you feel like that's comparable to kind of the efficiencies and system with that kind of bi-directional kind of vehicle charging system that you just outlined, um, which to me just seems kind of like a really different power system Yeah. Um, in thinking about a really distributed bi-directional inverter system mm -hmm. versus kind of like, uh, you know, some centralized uh, a high frequency, high response rate charging. Yeah. So the it, the issue, one of the practical issues with doing vehicle to grid is I think from a technical standpoint, it could be structured to be very similar to a centralized system in terms of operation. But in vehicle to grid, you're interfering with the degradation of an asset that people own, right? So if you have a station, if you have utility, you install a stationary battery, you can operate it kind of however you want. And if it degrades, you kind of just absorb that cost. But if like, I don't know, if you go and buy a Tesla and then you participate in vehicle to grid and then your battery degrades three times as fast as it would have otherwise, then you start to run into an issue. So you have to start taking into account different operating modes of how you would control those batteries. That's not something that we looked at in this study, but it's something you'd have to do if you want to do this in real life. So, cool. Okay, so I want to move to some other, just to show some other studies that have looked at how much energy storage you need. This was a study by the Renewable Energy, or National Renewable Energy Lab um, by a hand in 2012. It's called the Renewable Electricity Future Study. And basically US-wide, they looked at under a bunch of different scenarios, how much of each resource you would need to reach increasing levels of renewable penetration across the US. Um, this is assuming that there's a lot of interconnectivity between different regions of the grid, so you can import and export, which helps out a lot. But to reach 90% renewables, it's about 180 gigawatts in power capacity of up, up to eight hour storage. So that could be about 1,440 gigawatt hours. Um, that's still a large amount. And remember that between 90 and 100, it could increase a lot more. So, but these, these are some numbers that we have. And then um, another example, um, this was by a study by UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab basically of how to meet California's previous reduction, greenhouse gas reduction goal of 80% below your 1990 levels by 2050 under different grid configurations. And largely they find between 40 to 250 gigawatts of up to six hour storage. So 240 to 1500 gigawatt hours, right? So just kind of to sum it up, how much energy storage we need depends on a lot of what else is going on in the system. But a lot of these studies, depending on what goal they're looking at, sort of give you a range. We know we're going to need somewhere in the hundreds to thousands-ish 
of gigawatt hours of energy storage, right? That gives us kind of a target to say, okay, this is how much we'll need for planning purposes, at the scale we should plan on. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is, is that a good idea, right? If we need, you know, 500 gigawatt hours of energy storage, is it a good idea to build 500 gigawatt hours of energy storage and install it? Do we get, are the benefits that we get from building that much energy storage and using it, does that outweigh the impacts associated with the life cycle of those batteries when you build it to that scale? And that's kind of what we're going to look at here. So, as I said, it requires hundreds to thousands of gigawatt hours of energy storage capacity. Is it environmentally beneficial? That's the question we're trying to answer in this section. Or not answer definitively, but give some insight into it. So we know energy storage provides benefits, right? That's what we've talked about up to this point. But energy storage technologies also have their own environmental and health impacts. And a lot of these are not well understood, right? Binding those materials has, requires energy inputs and has emissions. Transporting them, manufacturing them, um, dealing with them at their end of life also has, requires resources, right? It produces emissions. Um, it's fairly well understood for lithium ion batteries because of the, their popularity in consumer electronics and now electric vehicles. But there are many, many different kinds of energy storage out there and we don't know a whole lot about the life cycle of these other energy storage technologies. And also energy storage technologies are moving pretty quickly, right? If you do an LCA and you assume some efficiency for the use phase of that battery, that could be blown out of the water in like five years, right? So it's moving quickly, meaning there's a lot of new unknowns, making it hard to characterize the impact of these systems relative to their benefit. But that's the framework that I want to talk about here. How do we compare the impacts and benefits of energy storage systems? Well, let's just simply define the net benefit. The net benefit, emissions benefit in this case, is basically what is the difference between the amount of energy, the amount of emissions you reduce by deploying a technology and the amount of emissions you contribute through, from different stages of their life cycle. So just very simple, right? Now for a solar, something like a solar panel or an electricity generating technology, this is a lot more straightforward because when you install a solar panel, it displaces fossil fuel generation, assuming it doesn't get curtailed. Then it also contributes impacts from its manufacturing and end of life processes. And as long as, long as solar generation is not curtailed, the ratio between the impact and benefit is gonna be about the same. So if you have one solar panel and you get a certain amount of generation from it over its lifetime that provides a certain amount of benefit by displacing a certain amount of fossil fuels. And it took a certain amount of resources and produced a certain amount of emissions to produce it. That ratio, if you build two or four or a hundred or a thousand solar panels, that ratio is going to be mostly the same as long um, economies of scale can help benefit that. But for a given level of technology maturity, that's going to be about the same. Yeah. But if you have electric inputs into the manufacturing process, then as you add renewables, yeah. that number goes down. Yeah, so you could have the feedback into that. That gets into the spatial variability of where those electricity inputs are and where the benefit is. But yeah, if they're in the same place, you get that feedback. So, so this is kind of what I'm talking about pictorially. Um, you have materials and energy inputs and that produces emissions. You use this solar panel, you get the benefit of emissions reduction. And then at the end of life, you have to deal with it and that can give you an emissions impact, right? But the point I wanna make is for something like an energy storage technology, this is not as straightforward because as I pointed out before, how much benefit you get depends on how much storage is already in the system, right? Your first unit of energy storage will give you a lot of benefit and your last unit of energy storage or like one that's installed much later on gives you much less benefit. But the emissions impact of manufacturing that both of those increments is the same, right? So that implies that if you install energy storage, just keep installing energy and storage, there's gonna be a point where the impacts outweigh their benefits. And we wanna find out where that is. And there's also a point where the benefits are maximized relative to their impact. So as I, I've talked about this before, it depends on how much storage is installed in the system. Um, as I showed before, you, your early units provide a lot of benefit and your later units do not, but the emissions contribution scales linearly with capacity. Yeah. There's some questions there about the, the initial statement, like for non-generating technology. Yeah. Uh, 
there's this greater complexity. Wouldn't, wouldn't that kind of be true for generating technology if the capacity is not needed and it's just like your, yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of yeah. a, sim, it's a similar idea. Yeah, so for electricity generating technology, if there is something that affects how much benefit you get from installing the next unit, such as curtailment, then that could affect that. That could affect it. So say, for example, if you install the next solar panel and 20% of its generation gets curtailed, then your benefit starts to diminish, right? So it does apply for that. But conceptually, it's more straightforward for generating technologies, right? So is there a capacity level where installing additional energy storage contributes more emissions than it reduces? And if so, how does this capacity threshold compare with how much energy storage we need to meet all these California policy goals? That's really what we want to answer. So to address this, we combine life cycle analysis. In this case, we did a lot of analysis on flow batteries with electric grid dispatch modeling, which is kind of my traditional background of expertise. And there are two concepts I want you to focus on here. First is what I call the MAEC, or the maximum allowable energy capacity. This is the point where if you install more energy storage than this, your impacts will outweigh your benefits. So that's like that. You don't want to go past there. You don't want to go anywhere near there, right? But then there's also the MBEC, which is the maximum beneficial energy capacity. And this is the energy storage capacity level you deploy on the grid, where the net benefit is at its maximum relative to its, relative to its impacts, right? So let's look at an example using some work we've, we've done, and this paper's in preparation, um, using vanadium redox flow batteries, looking at greenhouse gas emissions on the grid. So this graph, the y-axis is a greenhouse gas benefit. This is how much greenhouse gases you reduce, right? Positive is good. Positive means that deploying that energy storage system to, to the capacity on the x-axis will reduce your greenhouse gas emissions relative to what it was without it. And then the x-axis is the energy capacity of the storage you deploy. So first thing that we see here is we see that as you deploy more energy storage capacity, the early units provide you a lot of benefit you get this big increase, right? And then, so the benefits are much greater than the impacts in this region. Then you reach kind of this point of diminishing returns catches up with you, where the benefit you get from deploying the next unit of energy storage starts to decrease. Then your net benefit goes down. And then at some point, deploying the next unit of energy storage will actually make your emissions increase, right? And in this case, with vanadium flow batteries, in this scenario, this occurs at about 1,840 gigawatt hours, right? Now, this is an assumption that you're using all vanadium redox flow batteries. In reality, it's going to be a mix of different things, but we'll get to that later. So we don't, you don't want to go anywhere near here. Is there some kind of, like, He's standing oh, that oh, okay. I was like, what's going on here? Okay. <laughs> so this is just an example of what we're talking about. Now, you can do this for different kinds of environmental impact indicators. Let's look at particulate emissions. Now, I want to throw it out there that the impacts of particulate emissions are not necessarily the same as where the benefits are gained, right? But we can still look at this on an kind of on like an aggregated perspective. Yeah. So does this assume that it's a must take on renewables <laughs> primarily? So it's not in it's not enabling any ramp ups or peaker plants or any other fossil generators coming online, right? Having that storage because. There's been some studies, obviously, that yeah. have come out looking at storage systems and, and showing that you know some simulated results like this, where yeah. we see some additional uh, fossil generators um, yeah. that were actually bidding into capacity markets, not not actually dispatching, yeah. and they come online. So, so I'm assuming this is assume this this is predicated on 100% renewables being utilized to discharge and discharge the batteries. Yeah. So yeah, the batteries are yeah, that's correct. So for a particular matter. You notice, though, that where these thresholds occur are a lot lower than they are for greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> and that's because in California, we use mostly natural gas. And natural gas is not very particulate matter intensive to begin with. Now, if you're in a region that uses coal, you get, when you get a reduction, it's going to be very big, right? But for natural gas, um, the particulate emissions benefit is relatively small compared to the impact of manufacturing these batteries, right? even though they could occur in different regions. So you, your threshold occurs at a lower capacity, right? Now, even though they occur in different regions, you, it does run into this equity issue of, okay, 
we'll get particulate emissions benefits from where we live and make particulate emissions worse from where people are manufacturing these batteries, and that's an energy equity issue. So that's why I still look at it. And then, uh, yeah. So a question just about uh, these two different terms, the, the maximum yeah. this capacity threshold versus <laughs> the maximum better, the yes, it, energy. Yeah. And you seem to be focusing on a threshold, but uh, shouldn't you focus on the other measure, which actually gives you the greatest yeah. amount of benefit, right? It's not, that's total benefit on the yeah. axis. Yeah, right? correct. Okay. Yeah. So you want, this is where you should target. Right, but the reason why I put both of these on here is because the deployment of capacity, especially energy storage capacity, it's not something that's centrally mandated, right? It's not like California can go and be like, we will deploy X amount of gigawatt hours of storage. You have people doing it in their homes, you have commercial businesses doing it kind of of their own volition, you have utilities doing it for different reasons. So, this sort of map gives you sort of a range of where you're going to end up, right, and sort of give you a sense of where you should target. So. And then just kind of a similar concept for a, a terrestrial acidification potential. Um, you have thresholds that occur at different points, right? Based on how the, in, the benefits you get from how it interacts with the grid and the impacts you get from manufacturing and producing these batteries. So all of this is varying energy capacity with a fixed power capacity because vanadium flow batteries can do that separately. Um, but we can also vary both the power and energy capacity. So the y-axis here is the power capacity and the x-axis here is the energy capacity. This is for greenhouse gas emissions for yield matter and acidification potential. And then your MBEC, your target point will look like a dot. And then your threshold that you don't want to go beyond or anywhere close to kind of looks like this contour line. So this is kind of the framework we want to do. Um, we really would like to do this for a whole suite of many different energy storage technologies and figure out how they compare. But this is just to show that it is possible to get too carried away with deploying energy storage and end up shooting yourself in the foot. Now, the last thing I kind of want to talk about in this respect is the sensitivity to material selection, right? Um, so Fresh Kendall is an expert in LCA, and she knows that life cycle inventories are, can be kind of all over the place for a given technology. In this case, vanadium redox flow batteries, we looked at different scenarios for how the vanadium pentoxide electrolyte is produced, right? whether it's from a byproduct of steel making or whether it's from coal or whether, you know, in an electric arc furnace or a blast furnace and so on. And we have the black dot here, which is the original value. This here is the MBEC, which is your target point. And then this is the MAEC, which is the point you don't want to go close to or go beyond. And then taking into account these different scenarios, we, have, we end up with these ranges, right? And what you can see is that depending on your selection, of your production process for components in this battery, you can either increase or decrease where these thresholds occur, right? So that really highlights the importance of if you're going to build energy storage technology and you're gonna to deploy to scale, you really wanna put the investment into making sure that you have low life cycle footprints in its manufacturing processes and you manufact yeah, manufacturing and materials and so on, right? So this really sort of brings that into focus. So let's compare to wrap this up. This is kind of the ranges that we saw for how much gigawatt hours of energy storage capacity we'll need to meet in different kinds of goals, right? The MAEC and MBEC, in this case, for where you're using vanadium redox flow batteries, they're kind of on similar scale, right? It's not a definitive, oh, it's gonna make it worse, or oh, it is always better. But this is just to show that these are kind of in the same ballpark as the amount of energy storage we need. So that really drives home the point that, hey, we really need to reduce the impact that we incur from manufacturing all these batteries if we want to deploy them to scale. Because we want, we want to be able to deploy this, these levels of battery capacity, of energy storage capacity, without running into a lot of these unintended consequences or, minim, or minimize the amount to which we run into them, right? So it is possible to get too carried away to cause greenhouse gas emissions to increase if you're not careful. And I do want to say that we will still need a large amount of energy storage. So even these amounts, this is still a very extreme amount of energy storage, right? So we'll still need a lot of it, but there is such a thing as too much energy storage. And in the case that this isn't enough, the uh, capacity where you still get net benefits, in the case that that isn't enough, you're going to need other load and generation shifting technologies like EV smart charging and all these other things 
to reduce the amount of energy storage capacity that you're going to end up needing in the end. So just to summarize, energy storage provides benefits by making use of excess renewable generation. But the early units provide the largest incremental benefit, and that was shown as important. Large energy storage capacities are needed to meet California's policy goals, but if you deploy them to scale and if you're not careful, you could potentially reduce or eliminate the net emissions benefit you get from doing so. Energy storage must be complemented by other load and generation shifting technologies to ensure meeting these goals provides net emissions benefits. Then careful material selection and prioritization of energy storage technologies and pathways with low life cycle emissions footprints is critical for allowing more energy storage capacity to be installed and still provide a net environmental benefit. And this is something we can only find out by combining life cycle analysis with operational modeling. So I make this point because at the state level and in a lot of the reports that are coming out for this is how we should meet X and Y policy goal, those are focused almost exclusively on the operation, right? And they, they're not bringing this life cycle of perspective <coughs> into account for the perspective of planning. But through looking at energy storage here, we show that that's pretty important, right? Especially for something like greenhouse gas emissions, which is a global impact, right? So future work, uh, we really want to sort of characterize where these thresholds and their sensitivities occur for many, many different kinds of energy storage technologies and compare them against each other. That's going to involve a lot of work and a lot of data, and that's something that Alyssa and I talk about. And then, um, you know, maybe optimize or, you know, improve the portfolio of energy storage technologies to try and provide the best emissions benefit from a life cycle perspective. That's kind of vague, but that's just kind of an idea that we're thinking about. So addressing all these questions, going back to what I was saying, that it's very interdisciplinary. Um, so we're open to collaboration as far as that goes. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but did you look at the, uh, the facilities that you need for storing this vast amount of energy storage you're talking about, like in terms of the uh, infrastructure that you need? What are the costs involved in yeah. uh, that in the LCA analysis as well? Yeah, so I did not. Um, we looked at the, we did LCAs on the energy, the energy storage technologies themselves, and what we did is we worked with three different manufacturers of low battery technologies. And they gave us materials data for how much materials is needed and what the manufacturing processes are to build a unit of their product installed in the ground. So we, our LCA includes up to that point, but we didn't take into account, oh, you need extra transformers and extra distribution lines and things like that. We didn't, we didn't go that far. Yeah. You need to keep them at a certain temperature or humidity level, so you have to build up yeah. you know, the infrastructure there might be okay. yeah so some batteries a lot of that is battery technology dependent because some batteries are a little more robust to temperature swings than others um funny example is that lithium-ion batteries are very picky when it comes to temperature right uh, we actually at uc Irvine on our microgrid we have an old lithium-ion battery that's installed and its rated round trip efficiency is 85 percent does anyone want to guess what its actual round trip efficiency is 33 <laughs> Not that bad, but <laughs> it's like 60, right? And that's because it's very picky when it comes to temperature. So we have these blowers and coolers keeping it cool all the time, and that's a humongous parasitic load on the battery. So something like lithium ion batteries are very sensitive to that. Flow batteries are a little bit less sensitive to that. So a lot of that will depend on the type of technology. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, we're all in that direction. Uh, are you like the last point you had about uh, diversifying the energy storage portfolio? Uh -huh. I'm kind of worried that uh, all the momentum behind uh, the lithium ion batteries yeah. is kind of going to hijack the market. I think in the near term it will, but the main thing is that lithium ion is very good for needs that we have clearly identified, which is short term shifting. The perspective of seasonal shifting is not something that we're not far enough on the renewable penetration um, spectrum for that to be an issue yet. So I do think that lithium is definitely the first stake in the ground and there's gonna be a lot of that. 
But I think once we start running into the issues regarding longer, the needs for longer duration storage, that's where it's going to be opened up a lot more to other kinds of energy storage technologies. And then from a scoping standpoint, that's something that's already ongoing. Um, the, grant that, the grant that we were awarded to do life cycle analysis on flow batteries was specifically because of that point. People at the CEC were like, hey, lithium is great, but if we need long duration storage, we're not sure lithium is going to work. So can you guys do an LCA of flow batteries? And we're like, sure. And they gave us money. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Can you comment broadly on how that analysis could compare to lithium ion? You said lithium ion was more defined, had more LCAs done. Yeah. So we've we've only done some preliminary work on this, and I think I would I would say at this point I don't want to make a definitive conclusion about it because it's very sensitive to the materials input. So even for lithium ion batteries, yeah. um, there's lots of different chemistries, and depending which chemistry you pick. You can it can be better or worse than flow batteries, um, so that's kind of something we're something we're working on. Yeah. Great presentation. Uh, Thank couple you. questions. So one, um, you know, it seemed like like curtailment is the natural one to maybe swing as an idea for thinking about that. Um, you know, kind of bivariate uh, environmental impact piece about yeah. how much is it worth to just build a lot of extra renewables yes. versus site any storage at all. Mm -hmm. Who cares about curtailment really if it's not a big yeah, you know, dr drag environmentally and obviously capacity factors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you think about how solar efficiencies degrade, especially at the end of life versus batteries degrade at the end of life, mm -hmm. drop it off a cliff. Yep. Maybe it's nicer to just have solar panels dying in the field over the long. Yeah, time. and there's a lot of studies that have sort of looked at that perspective. And um, some studies we're doing in our group, um, we're doing a study. We're doing a study in our group. We published one paper on it, but we're doing more on it. That looks at if you have excess renewable generation what's the best use of it, whether it's for charging vehicles or going to energy storage or just leaving it curtailed. Right. And depending on the costs of these systems that you use to chase down the last bits of curtailed energy, sometimes it's better to just leave it curtailed. And then um, there's some other work that went on too, of like depending on the costs and the research, the costs and how much you need to overbuild, a lot of the planning studies do allow that some amount is gonna be curtailed because from a cost perspective, it's not worth chasing down those last like two hours of the year to, you know, to make it be hundred percent renewable or something. So that's a perspective that's out there. Um, and it's definitely an option, right? It might be better to just leave it curtailed. Then it gets into a sense of how much you need to overbuild and different story, but yeah. And just a quick follow-up, just, just, is just, uh, on those results you were showing for the greenhouse gas kind mm -hmm. of results, is it, can you talk to a little bit about what kind of cycling you were assuming as far as, is that a, a cycle per day and how long those batteries are lasting in the field? Yeah. The so, um, since we're using vanadium redox flow batteries, uh, they, so manufacturers guarantee this, but we haven't tested it because it's relatively emerging technology, but the manufacturers say that it's unlimited cycles over 20 years um, for a vanadium redox flow battery. Whether that's actually the case, um, vanadium redox flow batteries haven't been operating long enough to know whether that's the case. But as far as what's the cycling, I would say it's more than one. It's more than one per day. Okay. Yeah. So slightly one, more than one per day. Yeah. Twenty years at constant efficiency. Yeah. Okay. So, but that, but that's that gets to that technology point because. If you try to do that with a lithium ion battery, you're, you might degrade like way faster, right, than your rated lifetime. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, so, I think you had one in the back. Yeah, I was wondering how you think about the trade offs between different types of environmental impacts. Mm -hmm. So, for example, beyond pointing out that there's a difference between the different impacts, how you can kind of compare at some level the greenhouse gas emissions benefits of this energy storage with the mm -hmm. sort of higher local and particulate matter? Yeah, so that's a good question, and it's also a very difficult question. So the way that different environmental impacts try to get compared, um, they so in life cycle analysis, they have midpoint and endpoint indicators, and then there's also a lot of focus on human how it impacts human health. And there's a lot of work kind of in the economic monetization field to try and put all of those different kinds of impacts on monetary terms so that you can compare them and try to get a sense of which one is more important. The issue is though, the monetization of different kinds of environmental impacts is highly controversial because there's an inherent value judgment based on who is making the decision. And then even if you're characterizing human health impacts, those are based on epidemiological studies, which 
take a really long time and have a large amount of uncertainty in them. So it's, there are efforts to try and systematically quantify that, but it's very difficult. So I think in practice, it is gonna end up being more of a qualitative local sort of judgment type of deal. Yeah, um, so, so you had next. Yeah. Uh, when you're looking at like the environmental, like the life cycle analysis of these batteries, like is there any discussion about like, well, maybe with like increased scale, like the, there will be like more focus on reducing the environmental impacts like mm -hmm. on the production side of the battery? Yeah, so that's, that's also a very good question. In this study, we didn't look at how potential economies of scale can reduce the life cycle footprint per unit capacity of these batteries. Um, that's largely because, um, you know, for the technology you looked at, which is vanadium redox, like flow batteries are kind of, a lot of them are still relatively early stage, so they're evolving relatively quickly. And it's kind of hard to project out how economies of scale are gonna help them. But that's, that's also important is that hypothetically, economies of scale could reduce the environmental impact per unit capacity associated with these kinds of battery technologies. And that's, that's something we should look at, though. And I'm sorry, you had your next in the back. Well, this builds on uh, Reese's question and also Meg's about monetization yeah. of these components. So, is it, do you, from your perspective, is it better to think holistically about, okay, here's a battery which has all these different trade offs, these impacts, versus looking at each individual material and saying, let's, instead of regulating or kind of, kind of providing insight, hey, we've got to be careful about this particular technology which integrates all these materials that mm -hmm. have the LCA impact. Yeah. Just focusing on the actual impacts of each material. And then and this, you know, it's a monetization question again. But yeah. The idea is where where can regulation be better, uh, more impactful when when trying to plan a system? So yeah. So yeah, so that's a that's a very good question. And there's not a definitive answer to that. Um, the issue is because material supply chains are kind of difficult to track and regulate individually, because say for example, this Vanadium redox flow battery, it uses a lot of different materials, but the materials that are in there are not just used for vanadium redox flow batteries, they're used for all kinds of other things. So I think it's very difficult for a regional government to try and um, put regulations on individual materials because it's hard to capture the scope of where all those materials are used. Um, so I do think that more of a aggregated or kind of end product type of regulation will be more clear from a policy perspective. That's that's sort of my thoughts on that. There was a, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if the maximum benefit point mm -hmm. would vary for a grid of like the same size in a different place using different, uh, different resources to supply the grid. So like, does it matter what the baseline is when you're determining your maximum Benefits. Totally does. Yeah. So because the benefits are based, so going back to what energy storage does, right? Energy storage shifts excess renewable generation to coincide with load. If you go to a different region and your wind and solar and load profiles are different, right? Even if it's the same size, the benefit that you get from installing a unit of energy storage capacity will be different, right? Because it depends how much it has, how much it has to shift and so on and so forth. So it is definitely um, a regional, a regional consideration you have to take into account when you're calculating these thresholds. So, thank you. Yeah. I guess a, a couple things come to mind. One is, if, to Ben's question, it seems like taxing pollution mm -hmm. broadly and actually enforcing it. Yeah. <laughs> the element of that, mm -hmm. we give a price signal through the entire material supply chain. Yes. That would push all products all uses towards cleaner options yeah. because th that would be in their price. So, yeah. so that, that seems like a, a rational route. Mm -hmm. See, plus there was, plus there was a plus lift. Except yeah. the dirty word you used. Yeah, well, well <laughs> we could just call them tariffs. <laughs> somebody else is going to pay them and then everything yeah. would be cool. I, so, yeah. But then the, the, other, the other thought is, uh, is um, it, it seems like the whole idea of storage here really to me is is flexibility mm -hmm. in terms of that can be met by flexibility on the load side that yes. can be met by storage that can be met by flexibility on the generation side yeah so it's really it seems like coming to a, a more holistic valuation of flexibility on yes time scales like is and 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 that articulating that 
like to the planners and to the market seems like it'd be of immense value because yeah. because right now we, we pick all these different things and I oh I love lithium ion batteries they should win. Oh you love yeah. lithium from yeah. so I love fuel cells I love yeah. you know, it's hard to say oh, everybody loves renewables mostly yeah. <laughs> and then you know like but how did how did get to that evaluate that valuation for flexibility is I mean I think is is a key component. Yeah that, that would inform agnostically all the different different technologies. Yeah, I agree. And it's something that's starting to be talked about. Um, the US Department of Energy has this initiative as part of their grid modernization grid modernization initiative called Beyond LCOE. So a lot of the costing is based on levelized cost of electricity. You try to find different ways to boil it into that. Um, but traits such as flexibility or you know resiliency or things like that don't really don't get converted very well into an LCOE calculation. So there is some on, there's some ongoing conversations at the DOE to talk about what kind of metrics should we use to assess the value of a lot of these different characteristics that we know are important, but don't kind of fall, fall into the traditional cost and framework for electricity technologies. Um, they haven't produced the results yet, but that's something I'm following. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just another question building on that. So we're just having these blackouts, right? That mm -hmm. are, uh, and it seems to me that that's gonna start up a whole new market, right? Because yeah. Because people buying up diesel gen sets. Mm -hmm. um, they're gonna be demanding the power walls, which are not in stock. And yep. so there's gonna be a more uh, entrepreneurs that are coming out with uh, you know, battery packs that are available. And it strikes me, it reminds me of kind of the movement to do the distributed scale solar, right? Yeah. Or rooftop solar, right? So there were trade-offs to that, right? Yeah. Um, for people investing in solar solar generation on their own homes, right? Both yeah. economic impacts, but also like maybe not the most cost effective in terms of uh, optimizing where you put storage, both from an equity standpoint and from a system standpoint. Yeah. So where do you see kind of the risks associated with kind of the rush to Home Depot and the coming? I see. <laughs> yeah. So. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of a kind of a hard a hard one to answer is because the and I was actually talking actually just yesterday I was talking to an NPR reporter about this topic is that the, so there's this kind of the reaction of okay there's these blackouts I don't want to deal with these blackouts so I'm going to go buy some power walls right but and also going back to the previous question is that we don't have a good or agreed upon way for valuing backup power or resilience on like a broader scale right. So a lot of these people are going to go to you know Home Depot or go on the Tesla website and order some power walls, and I don't think the ec kind of the economic risk associated with doing that is well understood, right? Because when you when you install a system for backup power for resiliency, it's kind of like hedging. It's like okay, I'm going to install this battery, and if I experience a blackout or a certain amount of blackouts, I'm going to lose this much money or value or so on and therefore the cost of installing this battery up front is less than the cost of losing all this stuff during blackouts right that's kind of, but quantifying how much you lose during blackouts is difficult and then also um if you buy batteries for backup power and then you end up not having a blackout then it's kind of like you just bought a battery just kind of because right and that's kind of sort of it has to be a non-monetary decision that we have to make in terms of like outside of whether it's economically effective for me or in general, um, do I want to have the peace of mind of knowing that I can survive a blackout, right? And that's something that I think it, that's something that I think that's going to have to be a qualitative decision. That makes sense. I, mean, I think that's, yeah. I mean, that's insurance though. I mean, yeah. It's not, it's not a non-economic decision. It's just how does someone prefer risk? Yeah. Risk. Yeah. It's not like there isn't the standard way of trying to quantify insurance like yeah full science yeah i guess that's true yeah um but with that logic it's kind of assuming that the batteries aren't being used for backup power but as yes. far as ious room to time of use rates mm -hmm. where you could have savings by using your power wall versus drawing from the grid yep. you could have added benefits yeah so i think it's i agree that economics are difficult but i think it's Again, I mean, value stacking yeah. is what makes these cost yeah. effective. And so, you know, also providing people that 
there's other benefits beyond just yeah so so I agree to kind of make to kind of to get batteries in the ground for being able to be used as backup power you also have to enable them to be used for a lot of different things right and quantifying the value of that is very important um, the thing with value stacking right now is a lot of those characteristics that energy storage can provide don't are not accounted for in the way we value um, like energy resources and electricity costs and so on and that's that's another part of the beyond LCOE initiative so yeah are there any other like technologies that are comparable or competing on a robustness scale so something like they may be less efficient than a battery or something mm -hmm. so something like cracking hydrogen using fuel yeah. so I don't know what yeah so the thing is every energy storage technology is going to have some trade-offs right so Lithium ion, we use lithium ion because energy density is relatively high and it's pretty high efficiency, but you can't store energy for that long, right? For over like, you know, multiple days or so on, unless you just put a whole bunch of them in one region. Um, flow batteries, their benefit is they, they're actually lower efficiency than lithium ion, um, but they can be sized more custom because you can s change the power and energy capacity separately and they don't degrade as fast, right? Things like hydrogen energy storage, the efficiency is significantly lower than lithium ion batteries. But if you use, if you do things like repurpose the current natural gas infrastructure for storing hydrogen or renewable natural gas, hypothetically, the amount of capacity you could, you could have is very, very, very large. And that can deal with seasonal storage at the hit of, at the efficiency hit, right? Then there's other kinds of storage depending that are faster but they don't store a lot say like flywheels can respond very fast but they don't store a lot so i would say like for storage there's lots of different kinds of storage out there and they're all good at one or a handful of things right and i think how much of them is going to penetrate the market is going to depend on you know whether what they're good at is what we value in developing our energy system right so yeah one of the graphs you showed uh, suggests that seasonal storage is the big gap, right? Like when you're trying yeah. to get to the 100% goal, yeah, right. That's that's where the biggest challenge will be. Yeah, because you have to you have to be able to store a lot of energy, right? right. So, so where do you see? And, and I think there was an earlier question about electric like, vehicles don't really solve the seasonal storage problem. Correct. Right. Yeah. So where 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 are the opportunities like from a storage standpoint? You mentioned hydrogen. Are there any others that you see? Yeah, so hydrogen is a big one. Um, depending on the region, I think maybe it's not, not as much in California, but depending on the region, um, hydropower, like pumped hydropower can be really big. Um, depending on the region, compressed air could also be very big. Um, but a lot of those are going to be geographically limited, right, or dependent on whether, so if you're to do seasonal storage with pumped hydro, you need to have to be in a region that has very, very large hydro reservoirs relative to your water demand. Right. So there's other large scale technologies that are out there, but they tend to have geographical constraints. Um, and then, you know, hydrogen is one that you could scale, but really, if you do hydrogen, you'll want to repurpose the current gas infrastructure instead of building new storage because that's very expensive. What about the concrete? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah so viable? the concrete storage, theoretically, theoretically, it works, but the issue I have with concrete storage is that. Um, you need a lot of material because the energy density is very low, right? So if you think about all the way back to physics one that you guys took a long, long time ago, you know, gravitational potential energy is not very strong, right? It's not very energy dense. So, so if you want to get a lot of energy stored in a gravitational field, you need to have either a really big distance or a really big amount of material. And if we're talking about an LCA standpoint, if you're going to have a very large amount of concrete, I'm not really sure how that's going to work out as far as greenhouse gas emissions go. Yeah. Yeah. Did you consider doing the study again, finding uh, the maximal benefits point if the grid is expanded so you can like, utilize more solar resources in California across the country? Um, we have not done that, but that's something that we should do, right? And it's largely... So that's another thing too is, and they've talked about this in Europe, of being able to interconnect grids and allow more dynamic import and export between grids um, does alleviate a lot of these constraints quite a bit. Um, in California, they're starting to go with that to a limited extent. Um, Kaiso, which is California's grid operator, 
um, has started the energy imbalance market and they're trying to get other utilities to participate in it from other states. It's having some, I mean, it's, it's working, but it's having some pushback from other utilities. So that's definitely something that would be, that would be beneficial to look at. Right, well, All right. Okay. Oh, she has last question. All right, <laughs> last question. So speaking of Kaiso, um, I interviewed with them this summer, mm -hmm. and one of the things we were talking about was the fact that currently in the market, the energy storage that's on board isn't really being used for energy uh, awards. It's mainly being used for like spinning yeah, or for capacity reusing. products. Yeah. Um, and so it's actually not doing any of this energy energy shifting that mm -hmm. we all want it to. Um, yeah. And so the team was kind of thinking part of it is technology limitations with lithium ion, which is mainly what's on the grid, not wanting to do the deeper discharges to really yeah. move big chunks of energy. Um, and I think part of it is because like AB 2514 is pretty technology agnostic. It's yeah. so just like least cost, mm -hmm. um, which is why I think we have so many lithium ions. So I guess, do you have any recommendations about what California or Kaisen should do to kind of help encourage this kind of uh, energy movement that you want storage to do? Yeah, so largely there has to be a product that these storage systems can fit into, right, to provide that. And the thing is, um, that gets into like market design and stuff that I'm not an expert in. <laughs> but um, the reason why they're being used for capacity awards is because that's what they can get paid for, right? If there, is, if there was a good way of being able to monetize the value of energy shifting and being able to afford that to the people that own batteries, then they would bid into that market as well. Um, as far as specific recommendations, like I said, I'm not an expert in like electricity rate market design, but that's kind of where the details have to be sorted out. Thank you.